The National Conservative Movement um, is, uh, in no, is no more, if it ever was, and indeed it never was, not, is not an extreme or a fringe movement, any more than it was in the speeches, policies, and philosophy of Churchill, Reagan, and Thatcher. They were all unambiguously national conservatives. And when Margaret Thatcher was told at one point, uh, wasn't it the case that nationalism had led to the oppression of nations in Europe in the Second World War, she said no. What had happened was that a post-national racial collectivism had conquered nations which then resisted and eventually recovered their liberty because they were countries which possessed patriotism and nationalism of a generous and moral kind. Now, the most important point, though, about this conference is this is, the com this is a conference of a movement that realizes most clearly the scale of the challenge facing conservatives of, of all kinds, Nas notably that we are facing the long drawn out collective nervous breakdown of our entire civilization, whether in Europe, in the Anglosphere, or in the West as a whole. Uh, we can call that nervous breakdown many things, but I think the umbrella term for it now has got to be identity politics. Personal identity politics, national identity politics, ideological identity politics, in all of these different ways, and indeed leaning upon each other, um, our, our opponents um, have um, adopted an, a set of ideas that is leading to a combination of incomprehensibility and ruin. Um, what do I mean by this? Do, we mean, do I mean the politics of personal identity or sexual identity that we see playing out in America's universities or the politics of national identity versus European identity that we see in the Brexit debate or the politics of racial identity throughout the advanced world, including the United States? Um, I mean all of them because they all derive from the same error and all move towards the same mixture of outcome. Almost 20 years, actually 30 years ago, I got interested in the question of identity, then just beginning to be a political one. It seemed to me at the time that all these different identity disputes, there were fewer then, um, offered roughly the same choice. Do we think that identity is something that we get handed down to us, willy-nilly, by our parents, society, sex, race, class, nation, and then take for granted as we go through life? Or is identity something that we think about and choose voluntarily. It was clear to me from early on that the postmodern concept of identity, the second concept, was advancing in psychology, the neurosciences, the media, theater, film, uh, the world of culture generally, and above all in the universities, among the intelligentsia and the young. That was the theory, that is the theory, that the self is almost infinitely malleable and that we may choose our identity or identities rather than simply receiving them, hand me down, so to speak, from our genes, our society, our parents, or the wider environment. Now, when we choose a theory of identity to believe as true, consequences flow. Because if there's no hard given core to our personality, then our identity is indeed malleable. And we can choose, maybe several times. Um, the principle on which we want to have an identity. And that principle was in fact laid down um, by the, the then greatest living American psychologist, Tom Wolfe, in his essay, The Me Decade. It began life as an advertising slogan. If I have only one life to live, let me lead it as a blonde. The charm of that principle is that a new identity, for constructing any new identity, is that it is infinitely accommodating. It enables us to say to ourselves, if I have only one life, let me lead it as fill in the blank. Now, all that sounded highly theoretical when I wrote about it 30 years ago. And I doubt then that any of us would have imagined young intellectuals taking their theories to the extent of believing that their sexual identity, including their biological identity, was entirely a matter of their arbitrary choice.
I think Tom Wolfe is a different matter. He probably would have been able to see that. Yet that is the situation we see in some of the best universities in America or the world. Moreover, the choice of the identity bearer, however seemingly arbitrary, uh, um, is then enforced by college administrators that indeed um, insist that all of us address the person by whatever neologism he or she has invented to represent their new identity, which plays, incidentally, hell with grammar. <laughs> Moreover, as Richard Newhouse observed in a different context, once orthodoxy is optional, it soon be once orthodoxy is optional, it sooner or later becomes prohibited. Professors who resist this new fashion in elective identities and continue to refer to students as him or her and related uh, devices are threatened with serious penalties, including the loss of their positions. This must be especially tricky for any writer or intellectual of precise taste and judgment because the rules governing the protection of these new identities change constantly and are anyway beset with contradictions. Let me give one example. It is held to be morally wrong to assert that someone who is a man biologically but a woman by choice and surgery is not genuinely female. At the same time as sexual identity is becoming a voluntary matter, sexual orientation was becoming a hard and fast certainty that brooked no argument or indeed alteration. It's almost a secular mortal sin to argue that someone who is gay might be able to change his sexual orientation by, uh, by um, either religious commitment or psychiatric treatment. In fact, re so-called reparative theory is banned in many jurisdictions. Generally, by the way, the same jurisdictions that encourage or even finance sex change operations. So under this theory, although the theories change all the time, desire is fixed but not the object of desire. And therefore, let us say, Harvey Feinstein's defiant um, hymn to a gay identity, I am what I am, must be replaced in a gender, gender fluid age by I'm not what I was. <laughs> if personal identity is seemingly fixed, uh, uh, as, uh, as seemingly fixed as one sex are malleable, then what about identities of collectivities, of nation and religion. Um, they must surely, you would think, be more so. After all, there may be, there may be uh, sorry, they would be less valuable. After all, there may be differences about the degree to which a personal identity is socially constructed. But there can be no real doubt that a national identity is a social and collective one. Uh, the, that belief was the foundation of several ideologies in the last century, which sought to replace taken for granted national identities in Britain, Australia, and the US with new post-national ideological identities that look beyond the nation to new collectivities rooted in ideology, whether of place, race or of class. Now today, we see the same impulse to replace nationhood with something else in globalism, in the Europeanism of the European Union, in America, in multiculturalism, um, in the international relations and discussions in, um, by uh, globalism and global governance, and even, even in jihadism, even in Islam. Because jihadism viewed from a certain standpoint is Islam's zuma transformed into a new post-national global identity. These new post-national identities were even seen as inevitable um, by German professors who thought nations and nationalisms were withering away and therefore they would need to be replaced by other institutions. Now, I get to the impact of what happens when a new identity ideologically asserts itself in um, the marketplace and in personal life. As the late Kenneth Minogue, who was probably the first leading and still probably the best, um, so to speak, psychologist of identity politics pointed out, um, an, 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 an invented identity is bound to be both parasitic and adversarial with respect to the real thing. 
um, Minogue pointed out in The Alien Powers that the first impulse of anyone who has thrown off his old identity and embraced a new one is an evangelical impulse. He wants to tell everyone that once he was blind, but now he sees. But unfortunately, you are still blind, and he's obliged to inform you of that fact. Um, and and um, he sees for himself, and tries to persuade you, that his old taken-for-granted identity, which he grew up with, is an alien imposition by society, um, and, uh, and he must throw it off, and he must now try to do you the favor of helping you to replace that alien identity um, with something from among the range of identity choices available. I think the gay or feminist identity will define itself often in by, this is not true of all people who are gay, of course, it's talking about gay ideologists uh, and feminists. Will the gay or feminist identity will define itself by opposition to traditional sexual identities of male and female. These it will decry as socially constructed and consequently false and oppressive, in the approved jargon as heterosexism. In the case of national identities, the rival, rivalry between ideological nationalisms and taken for granted hand-me-down ethno-cultural nationalisms can be especially vicious. For pre-existing national loyalties are seen as important obstacles to the new national identity that is striving to be born. And since ideological nationalists, and I think as Orwell points out, almost all the vices of nationalism are much more present and much less ashamed of being present in, in, the, in new, what he called transferred nationalisms, uh, but which I would define as ideological nationalism. Um, Charles Stuart Parnell's principle that no man has a right to fix the boundary of the march of a nation it comes into play. And the opposition, that is to say you, me, and most people, uh, may legitimately face extirpation. Sometimes, literally so. Real people and real categories of people, uh, real pe peoples, were murdered in the campaign to create a new Soviet man. They were oppressed uh, by Kamalism, a movement I have some sympathy with, but nonetheless, uh, uh, Kamalism did in fact go to quite considerable lengths in attempting to extirpate a kind of um, political Muslim, Islam in a society uh, that was 98, that is 98% Muslim. We can see that most clearly, it seems to me, that the way this identity politics gen... Oh, okay, well, I'm actually on, let me see, well, I'm... <laughs> I've got a bit further to go. Uh, in the case of Bros, Bros, the post-Brexit debate in Britain, what that revealed was the huge, that there is a large section, probably 20% of the people, uh, had during the period of EU membership adopted a new national identity that was in conflict with the pre-existing British one. Uh, David Goodhart, somewheres and anywheres, uh, is an exam, is part of that. Uh, these Europeanists were outraged um, by the, um, when a majority of their countrymen uh, decided to take that identity away from them as they saw it. They have since adopted, in rhetoric, a fierce, contemptuous attitude to both the British identity and to any sense of fellow feeling uh, with their citizens, fellow citizens. And they use extraordinarily vicious and hostile language in their determination to resist the implementation of Brexit about their own country. Their position is similar, I would say, to the UK and American Marxists who rejected their own country in favor of a national identity of a post-modernist uh, utopian kind. And that's what's at play, too, in the desire of Americans, Brits, and others to subordinate the national interests of their countries to the decisions of bodies like the UN Kyoto process, the international courts, the EU, and so on. Now, I did have a long section, well, a short section, uh, on the two kind, on why internationalism is, in fact, something that is the province of um, uh, nationalists rather than, than post-nationalists. Um, let me just see if I can finish it. Um, uh, yeah. In effect, transnational or supranational bodies make nation states into its agents. Uh, on all political questions. 
International organizations, however, are the agents of nation states. They are created to advance common but specific endeavors. Joining them is an exercise of sovereignty, subordinating yourself to, an interna to a post-national, post um, transnational, supranational institution is a surrender of sovereignty. Um, um, let's see. The growing power of transnational bodies means, therefore, a diminution of democratic control and accountability in member states. Nation states, which supranational bodies seek to supersede, are the building blocks of any democratic internationalism. If democracy is intimately bound up with the nation state, as, as history overwhelmingly suggests, then international bodies whose decisions can ultimately be changed or rejected by the parliaments of nation states can claim democratic accountability at one remove. The same claim cannot be made by organizations whose decisions uh, are binding on the parliaments of, of member states which were not, but are not themselves directly accountable to the voters. The policy makers, well, um, I will end with a quote from Francis Fukuyama, who said about globalists and nationalists. Um, the globalists, he's talking about Americans and Europeans, but globalists and nationalists is in this context the right quote. Um, to the extent, globalists believe, to the extent that any international organization has legitimacy, it is because um, the I'm sorry, the, the nationalists believe to the extent that any international organization has legitimacy, it is because dem duly constituted democratic majorities have handed that legitimacy, legitimacy up to them in a negotiated process. Such legitimacy can be withdrawn um, at any time. Um, but the contracting parties, international law, but, but international law and organization have no existence independent of this type of voluntary agreement between sovereign nation states. Globalists tend to believe, um, tend to believe that democratic legitimacy flows from the will of an international community larger than any individual nation state. This international community is not embodied in any single global democratic constitutional order. It hands down legitimacy, however, to existing institutions which are seen as partly embodying it. Well, the problem, and this is my final point, the problem with the globalist position is that while such a higher realm of liberal democratic values might theoretically exist, it is very imperfectly embodied in any given international institution. The very idea that this legitimacy is handed downwards from a willowy, disembodied international level rather than handed upwards from concrete, legitimate democratic politics, publics on a nation state level, virtually invites abuse on the part of elites who are then free to interpret the will of the international community to suit their own preferences. I think that is the battle, that the main battle we have. But in order for that battle to, to be won, we have to also um, address the fact that a false concept of identity underlies almost all the, the, the democratic, the national, the personal, and increasing, and the social institutions in our lives. They would like to dictate to us what we are, and therefore what we must feel, and what our interests must be. We must maintain the right to assert those are jobs for us.